In my last video, I went over a couple of concerns that I had about Gotham Knights. Little did I know there was a Q&A with the Gotham Knights developers that addressed a few of the concerns that I spoke about in my last video. And because people wanted to hear more of my thoughts regarding Gotham Knights, I thought it'd only be right to give some updated thoughts about this recent Q&A. For what it's worth, this video is going to be a little different than how I usually structure my videos. Throughout this, I'm going to go over various question and answers, followed by giving my thoughts about these question and answers. However, I won't be going over the entire Q&A because some questions are not nearly as important as others, at least in my opinion. I know, it's weird, but I feel like that's the best way to go about it rather than trying to generalize my overall thoughts about the Q&A. Don't worry though, I'll make sure to put timestamps throughout the video to make the viewing experience far more bearable. Anyway, let's dive into the Q&A. Question 1. How alive is the open world in terms of civilians, weather, traffic, crimes, NPC interaction, enteral buildings, etc.? Everything mentioned in that question is present in our Gotham City to some degree. Each district in Gotham has a distinct mix of citizens. Since the player will only hit the streets at night, some neighborhoods have more of a civilian nightlife. Others are more industrial and bleak, but you'll encounter Gothamites from all walks of life and they will definitely have opinions about you and your vigilante activities. There's vehicle traffic of various types, pedestrians heading in and out of rail stations, city workers on the night shift, the weather varies from night to night while remaining true to the Gotham vibe. Players will be able to enter a variety of buildings usually because there's some illicit after hours activity underway and there is crime everywhere, both petty and major. This is a good thing, Gotham City is important to the overall Batman mythos. As we know, Gotham and his people consistently play a massive part in all of the Batman movies. So to know that Gotham Knights is going to continue that small detail is legitimately exciting. The biggest reason is that this, in a way, reminds me of Marvel Spider-Man. As you swing through the city of New York, you often get people rooting for you and cheering you on after saving people from a random crime that's happening in a random district of New York. That kind of encourages you to continue to solve those low-level crimes. For Gotham Knights, I actually hope they went in the opposite direction, which which I know is weird. In a way, I like the idea of Gotham having hard-headed people who hate vigilantes despite them needing those vigilantes. I almost want the NPCs to be mad at us or yell at us because they don't like us. It had that sense of feeling underappreciated, which is what being a vigilante is all about. I also thoroughly enjoy the idea of being able to enter random buildings that have either petty or major crimes going on. It adds to that play ground feel that I mentioned in my previous video. As we know, Marvel Spider-Man is basically one gigantic playground that wants you to explore and is designed to engage with the player. It wants you to stop a random car chase. It wants you to beat up thugs that are up to no good on a random roof. It wants you to explore every building to see if they're collectible items, which are spread throughout the entirety of New York City. This exact thing is going to make Gotham Knights feel like an open playground, almost like Marvel's Spider-Man, but instead it's always nighttime. This, of course, brings you to what is just as important for this game and is relevant to this question as well. Question 2. Are the random crimes completely dynamic? Like if we don't go see someone getting mugged, can we come back 2 hours later and they're still waiting to get rescued? Or will we be able to have consequences for our choices to create a sense of realism and urgency like in the comics and films? It depends on the crime. Some of the random opportunistic crime will still linger unless the player moves to intervene. Most of the bigger, more premeditated crimes have a failure condition if the player retreats after engaging. And of course, once the player returns to the Belfry and ends the night's patrol, those crimes won't be there the next night. While this doesn't sound as natural or fluid as what Marvel Spider-Man does, this to me still sounds like it's good enough on paper. The fact that there will be different types of crimes that will continue to go on if we don't intervene, crimes that will have failure conditions, and crimes that won't be repeated the next night, at least seemingly so, is a good thing. 
It adds depth to Gotham as a city and also will encourage us to explore the city. My biggest hope is that this game encourages us with some sort of visual notification to tell us a crime is going on not far from where we are. That way, we don't miss out on opportunities to save the day and don't miss out on potentially cool in-game moments. It'd also be cool if doing these dynamic crimes helps change the perception of the Gotham Knights. Imagine if you do enough of these dynamic crimes to the point where we get to see our chemistry in Gotham grow as we get further into the game. The more times we save the day by preventing crime, the more the people of Gotham begin to like us. That way, it continuously makes it feel like preventing these types of crimes will legitimately be worth it outside of the first couple of times we do so. Now that would be a genuinely cool feature, but you know, I won't expect that because I don't want to be disappointed for getting my own hopes up. And since we're talking about getting my hopes up, that brings me to arguably one of the most important questions in this Q&A. Question 3. Can you play through the entire game as the same character or will the story require you to play as each in different parts? Will some missions force us to play specific characters? You can play through the entire game as any character you want. There are no missions that force you to switch characters, although there is story content and a few side activities that are hero specific. This right here is what we needed to know from the very beginning. This negates all of the concerns that I touched on in my previous video regarding the experience of playing this game. I am so relieved to know that we will be able to focus on the character or characters that we want to specifically play. I am thoroughly excited to know that we're going to be able to find the character out of Robin, Nightwing, Red Hood, and Batgirl that fits our playstyle and not be forced off of them. My only concern, however, is whether or not they'll possibly nerf the characters who are getting played more so than others if they don't nerf any of the Gotham Knights on purpose just to try and push people onto other characters, then we're good. If anything, I hope that they fix any of the least played characters to make them feel better because that will be far more encouraging and get us to at least try those characters again after not initially clicking with them. Again, this is great news and it's highly relieving to hear this. I just wish this was something that they specifically marketed towards the people who are interested in Gotham Knights. The reason I say this is because in games like Marvel's Avengers and Marvel's Spider-Man, some of the biggest complaints were revolved around the moments we couldn't play our favorite characters. As we all know and understand, most people typically hate being taken off of their main character in a video game. If they got ahead and informed their target audience that this game is a game where you can play whoever you want, when you want, that would have made us even more excited from the get-go. This creative decision doesn't happen often in superhero games with multiple protagonists and making it loud and clear that Gotham Knights isn't making this common mistake is a massive win. It's a win for the people who don't want to be forced off of their favorite character. It's a win for Gotham Knights because it'll prevent the game from getting a fairly common criticism. And it's a win for the developers because this allows each Gotham Knight to have a different playstyle to stand out for one another, which will encourage people to find a character that fully clicks with them. Question 4. But in all seriousness, when it came to traversal, how did you make each night feel distinctly different from the other and how they traversed the roofs and alleys of Gotham? Batgirl glides in the most Batman-like way compared to the other heroes, and it's got a certain speed and vibe, but you are always playing the win, like speed controls, how fast you can go back up and going down accelerates you. It has a certain feel as you're hunting for crimes. Nightwing's glider feels different because it's a machine. You can angle it to climb up and around tall buildings as well as glide. Robin's teleport is almost more about snapping into a specific spot as you approach a crime and you can change direction of the teleporter target pretty fast. And Red Hood is just jumping on air basically so he's playing a platform game where he can invent a platform when you squeeze the trigger and it feels fast paced but it's the closest to the parkour feeling you have when you're running and jumping on rooftops. His is the most exotic, but our Red Hood is really connected to what he had to go through, surviving being killed and brought back, and his traversal reflects that. I'm sorry, but as much as I'd like to have a positive take on this question and answer, I can't have a positive take. 
The core reason why is that none of these different traversal styles looked great in the gameplay demo. Nightwing's glider simply looks awkward, I say this even though I don't really care that it's basically Fortnite's glider like most people complained about. Red Hood's jumping looks really bad despite how much backstory and layers they're trying to give Red Hood seemingly. And we've yet to really see any in-game footage of Robin or Batgirl so I can't really have any thoughts about the traversal styles but they at least sound good on paper. What sucks though is that while I can appreciate how many layers they're trying to give each Gotham Knight so each character stands out on their own when it comes to their own styles, I can't bring myself to be wowed or excited. It could just be the weird animations or it could just be the gameplay demo not really doing this game justice at all but because of that gameplay demo I won't be excited about these styles until I get to play Gotham Knights. Question 5. What roles slash archetypes would you say the cast fulfill and how or what are some builds each character might particularly excel in? So rad question, I think Robin is the best stealth focused hero, Red Hood deals high damage at range and can capitalize on enemy clusters, Batgirl has some health focused powers and has some cool hack stuff in the environment abilities, and Nightwing has the furthest combat mobility and has the most co-op support abilities. There's a lot of variety in places style though, so it's not 100% straightforward to answer. Like I can build a high melee DPS Batgirl build and I do a lot because I love her beatdown ability. You have options depending on what great gear you find and what skills you decide to invest the most points in. This is exactly what I wanted to hear regarding this cast of characters. I love the idea of skill trees and I love the idea of having a variety of character builds in video games. So to me, this is something that I'm eager to see in real time. I genuinely hope that if they do another gameplay demo, they show off these builds or at least how the player or players can make builds in the game. If this is something where every character has at least three or four potential builds, I'll be so damn happy. The sheer idea of having a superhero game that enables your creativity and allows you to tailor the character to your liking to the point where you basically have control over how they feel depending on the build you make sounds like a ridiculously good time. Remember, it's not often that we're able to essentially build a superhero and tailor them to our liking. I honestly would like to think that this is why the gameplay demo looked kind of clunky. Maybe whatever builds they were running were super basic or were at an early point in the game. The point though, on paper, is that this is fantastic news. I really, really hope that whenever we get to see this in action, it's as good as it sounds. Question 6. Is there a counterattack mechanism? When Red Hood is fighting the Talon Gladiator, it looks like he's got some unblockable attacks coming in, but can you counter or block? So we do counter, but as you spotted, it's not in a quick time event kind of way. Our combat system has regular and armored attacks, which means they can't be interrupted by normal moves, so you have to counter them with piercing abilities. Some enemies also have guard, block, which we can counter with guard break abilities. So our combat system has these layers where you sometimes need to provide a specific answer to a specific problem. Many player power moves can't be interrupted after the warm up animation so you can sometimes use that to your advantage. So when I first read this question and answer, I had a negative reaction to it. The idea of pivoting away from quick time event counters initially sounded negative to me, but then I realized that sticking with that would just make this game another unofficial Arkham game. And I really do understand how much they want to avoid that considering they did emphasize wanting Gotham Knights to be its own thing with its own story. So I totally respect wanting to not just copy and paste things for the sake of winning people over. Sometimes doing something new can legitimately lead to a good thing. My concern is whether or not these specific answers to these specific problems feel clunky or not. If this is a combat system where all of these layers and depth add up to a satisfying combat system, cool, I'm in. I'm totally down to having a multi-layered combat system that makes you think about the actual answers to your problem rather than mindlessly beating thugs up no matter how fluid that system felt in the Batman Arkham games. 
However, I can't help but be concerned about how good this combat system will feel in the hands of the player. What if they're doing too much? What if they're way over their heads? What if it's not deep enough or it's too deep to the point where it gets in the way of the player's enjoyment? Despite those ideas sounding legitimately interesting, it leaves far more room for concern than room for excitement. Question 7. Will the character armor upgrades be visible? I noticed in the trailer that Red Hood had different guns in the first half and second half of the gameplay walkthrough. Will it be the same for armor? Pick it up through combat drops, equip it and it changes our look. Can we choose different outfits for the buffs, but keep the original design of the characters? Lots of mini questions, so here we go. When you get a suit or blueprint, it has a visual style, a colorway, and stats. Weapons have a visual style and stats for each suit you wear. Additionally, you can customize mask, logo, gloves, and footwear. There's a lot of custom for each suit, and there's a lot of different styles for guns, tofas, batarangs, sticks. Generally, the visuals get more badass at the higher tiers, but each tier has a variety of suit styles. You can equip any gear in your inventory whenever you want, but for getting new gear, you return to the Belfry. The workbench in the Belfry is connected to a 3D printer, and so long as you have materials, you can craft any blueprint you find. Materials drop from activity rewards, supply chests, and defeated enemies. You can equip mod chips, think gems in other games, at any time if you find them mid-mission. For extra visual customization, you also obtain extra colorways, override the colors of a suit, and transmogs, override the whole visual look of a suit. As you play, you also find transmogs for suit styles you craft often, so if for some reason you want to override the look of your ultra awesome legendary tier suit with the visual of the suit from the start of the game, you can do that. This gives you some flexibility if your favorite gear, stats wise, doesn't have the look you want and it is all earned in game. Once again, why did they not go over this type of stuff in the first gameplay demo? This is the type of stuff that will actually make people far more excited and far more positive on Gotham Knights if they were told this from the get go. This is exactly what I wanted to be told when I first watched the gameplay demo. Instead, we were basically told stuff that made me far more concerned than anything else. This right here is fantastic news. All of this is basically a allowing us to be as creative as we want and I love that. I love the idea of being able to specifically design every little aspect of every Gotham Knight. That's going to inspire so many people to the point where I won't be shocked if we get a subreddit dedicated to Gotham Knights transmogs where people break down every aspect of their outfits. The best news though is that we get to even keep the visual styles we find at the very beginning of the game. This is such a massive win. The only real concern I have is how much grinding we're going to have to do to get certain styles for our characters. That's really it. As long as it's not incredibly obnoxious or styles are unlocked behind ridiculously difficult missions, I don't think I could complain too much about that. I just want the journey to unlocking different things to feel interactive and happen because the game encourages us to do so. I'm genuinely hoping that there's more to that potential grind than a mundane numbers game where we throw pointless lower gear out until we get higher gear or better crafting materials, as I said in my previous video. And those are the seven most important questions from the Gotham Knights Q&A with the developers, at least in my opinion. Well, it's safe to say that I'm a lot less negative on Gotham Knights now. My biggest concern is that this game's success is going to rely on people's word of mouth. All of this information that was revealed in the Q&A should have been in the initial deep dive, not just bits and pieces of this information. All of this sounds so much better than how things were worded in the Gotham Knights game play demo. And it's kind of sad that this is the case because people would possibly be far more positive or at least far more neutral on this game than they currently are. Sure, I know, people's opinions on graphics are one thing, which as I said, the game really isn't that impressive graphically, but I can get past that if the game is fun to play. However, all of those other intricate details are so much more important than most people probably think. Take me for example, I didn't know any of this information. If it wasn't for people telling me in the comments about this Q&A, I probably wouldn't be excited for Gotham Knights. 
And now, after reading the q and I'm actually interested to learn even more about this game. By the way, I'll link the entire q and in the description if you want to read about the things I left out in case you're interested. Until then, I'm simply going to keep an open mind with this game. I'm not going to create any expectations or any overly high hopes and dreams because I simply want to accept this game as is. And sure, that could be a bad thing, but at the end of the day, I'm not trying to be disappointed in this game because I couldn't keep my expectations in check. Let's just hope that all of the things that do sound good on paper from this Q&A ends up working out in the long run, because at the end of the day, as a DC Comics fan, I simply want Gotham Knights to be a good game.